You may be seated. I'm not going to read my text right now. But along with the title of my message tonight, Looking Good. Looking good. Brother old Donnie, how about that? Looking good. He loves it. Yeah. He never knows what's coming. <laughs> Hallelujah. I remember uh, as a 17-year-old high school graduate, no, I wasn't that smart. I just, uh, it's just the way I was born in November, so, and didn't, uh, I went to first grade at five years old instead of kindergarten. But um, our senior class, uh, we took a trip to New York City, and it was the first time that I had been to New York City, and I'd been blessed to be there a few times since then. Not that I care to go there, but yeah, that's another story. But um, during the trip, I think it was the first morning after we had arrived, uh, we were just off uh, Times Square, off 42nd Street in a hotel, and uh, me and a couple classmates I don't even remember where we were going, but uh, we went down to the subway, first time riding the big subway. So as I went down to subway, we had to take the subway, it was either that or a taxi cab, and the subway's a lot cheaper, to get to the place wherever we were going. And uh, we got down there, and it was just a few minutes yet before our particular train came that we were to catch to get to our destination. And it must have been uh, what they called rush hour in New York City. Because right after we got inside the turnstiles, the place started getting really filling up. And of course, after it's filling up, when we got there, there was nobody. And then within just a few moments, here it they're crowding you up and crowding you up and crowding you up. And I had ter heard all the ghost stories about over 100 people a year get run over by subway trains. That was back way back to, I don't know, it might be worse now or better, I don't know. But as the crowd gathered in, and I didn't realize how much that we were being pushed forward. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me to take another good look at my situation. And when I finally realized what exactly was going on, my toes were actually hanging over the platform at the subway terminal. And there were people like right up against me. And they didn't know me, thank God. <laughs> because you know, you, you don't know if somebody wants to push you or what. And at that moment, I don't know whether it was just a country boy that was afraid of something that was new, but I began to, and, and my friends did too, we began to kind of crowd our way back in because it didn't matter to me right then whether I was the first one on the train or not. Now, Saying that, I have often thought of that incident in my life, and I may or may not have died that day if I'd have stayed up there. More, more than likely, I probably wouldn't have, but I wasn't about to take the chance. And I have thanked God many times that I uh, realized and took another look at what was going on and my surroundings with me at that moment. And it's important for us, periodically, in our spiritual walk, to stop and take a closer look at what's happening in our life. What am I doing? What's going on around me? What do I need to do different? What do I need to do that I'm not doing? What do I need to do better? 
and uh, I'm uh, brought to my attention in the book of Second Kings, chapter six, and uh, I was reminded of that the brother that uh, spoke for us Sunday morning uh, was using a little different illustration uh, about this situation here with the prophet and his servant. Beginning with verse 15 in 2 Kings chapter 6, the word says, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? The Syrian army, or part of it, was surrounding them because the king of Syria wanted to kill the prophet because the prophet was getting direct connection, communication with God, telling the uh, Israelite army where the Syrian army was and where they were about to move to. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Verse 17, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open the eyes, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. See, the fellow took a second look, didn't he? Took another look. And you know, a lot of times, it's just like... uh, the brother mentioned Sunday morning about uh, Peter was walking on the water that time. And when when he took his eyes off of Jesus and began to uh, realize that I'm not in a good situation here materially, physically. But God doesn't operate. Our daddy doesn't operate in the physical. Can you say amen? He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Amen. Then I'm also reminded of Acts chapter 9, and this has always been a uh, one of my favorite little incidents in the Bible. And Saul had been praying on the rooftop at this time. And in beginning with verse 8, it said, And Saul rose from the earth. No, this was when he was on, I'm sorry, this was when he was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians and have them put to death. But as he was going, uh, he experienced uh, a supernatural experience. And it said, And Saul arose, verse 8, from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, And neither did eat nor drink. Now, this cat was praying for a better look at this time. Because right at that moment, he couldn't see a thing. He was blind. Now, and it even, as we, if we were to go on down into that chapter, it tells us the men that were with him didn't see this bright light. He's the only one that saw it. But it blinded him. And in beginning with verse 17, and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. He got a better look. Now you see, the only thing that was wrong with Saul to start with before this experience, was he had misguided God consciousness. I'm reminded of a good friend that I worked with at the plant. 
down to shop, and he had become a member of uh, our uh, apostolic church in uh, at uh, Life Cathedral. I keep wanting to say Staunton Street Apostolic Church because that's what it was when I first went there. And um, his kids were at uh, their grandmother's, who was a Baptist, and um, she was speaking something to them about, where are you guys going to go into church? And there's two little boys, and I think the, the one at the time, he was like about three years old. And she said, you need to be coming to my church with me, son, and not go to that Pentecostal church. And as serious as he could be, that little three-year-old looked up at his grandmother and he said, Mama, might be Baptist today, might be Pentecostal tomorrow. And I'm afraid that's the way some of us are until we get a better look at what's going on. We need to be Pentecostal all the time. Not just up here, not just coming out of our mouth. But the sad fact is, and I'm not looking at anybody if, uh, on this because tonight I really don't see anybody that fits that. They ought to be here and they're not. But we've got people that claim to be members of this church that walk a different walk, dress differently, act differently Monday through Tuesday and Thursday through Saturday. It's amen or oh me. Now, I'm sorry. It's amen or oh me. It's amen or oh me. That's why I adjure thee by Jesus that you take a look at where you are with your relationship with Jesus. You know, sometimes we get frustrated and say, man, I can't get a prayer answered. I can't get this answered. I can't get that answered. You know what? Little children know enough that if I obey my folks, my parents, I'm going to get more out of them. And I believe, yes, sir. And I believe, go ahead, go ahead. And I believe a lot of times we as the children of Jesus forget that if we're disobedient, he might be a little hesitant about answering my prayers. Come on. It's just the, like the guys that had the talents. You know what the talents were? They were the gifts of the Spirit. They were representative of the gifts of the Spirit. You remember he get, gave the one person, he said this master went away, and when he went away, he gave five talents. Of course, it was representative, supposed to be of money. But I believe it was an example of the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. And he uh, gave the one five talents and said, when I come back, I expect to, you know, to you would have a little more there. Gave the other two talents, and he gave the one one. And I'm afraid that so many Christians want to be like the guy that got the one talent. All he wanted to do, he is too lazy to do anything for the kingdom. So he just went and buried his talent. He said, man, you could even run down to the bank and at least got some interest for me. Hallelujah. Isn't that what he said? Of course, I'm paraphrasing. They might not have had a city national bank back then, but, you know. To the usury, to the lenders, could put my money in there and let me get some interest. But no, you were so lazy, you wouldn't even go out to the bank. And I've told my family, my grandchildren in particular, they get tired of hearing a lot of times. I said, look, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it's not the end all. It's the beginning. You better start looking a little good. Start looking a little better, a little more often. What can I do for Jesus? What can I do for Jesus? Then in Acts chapter 10. Beginning with verse 10. This was the one where Saul was on the rooftop. And he was praying. And he said he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. He kind of like was out of it. And I saw heaven and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. 
wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done three times, thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now, while Peter doubted in himself, in other words, he's pondering this, what this vision which he had seen should mean. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Isn't God's timing perfect? Amen. Perfect. And then skipping on down, no, that was it, uh, arise, therefore. So uh, verse 34 and 35, it tells about how Cornelius approached him up to this point and, and told him, said, I've been praying and God sent me here, basically in a nutshell is what he said. Well, then in verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. You see, in case you didn't realize it, up until this point, Peter and the other disciples were always of the opinion that salvation was just for the Jews. Just for the Jews. That's why this sheep with unclean animals appeared unto him in this vision, which caused him to take a second look. Amen. You know, we wonder a lot of times, some strange things happen in our life. Why did I, like the brother said Sunday again, why did I have that flat tire? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? You know? It might be had that flat tire because you was headed for a big accident right up the road. Somebody was going to run into your car and kill you. You never know, see. So it always, it always behooves us to continually be open to God's direction. Peter was another one that was zealous for God, but he was a little bit misguided. Now, nah, you Gentiles, you can't have, you know what? If God hadn't let the Gentiles in, I don't know of a Jew sitting here tonight. Some of you might be a, have a little bit of Jewish blood in your background, but we all would not have had a chance. We would not have had a chance to be partakers of God's salvation. We wouldn't have had it. But he got that second vision and realized God pours the Holy Ghost out in every nation, whether you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. And I thank God. Let's thank God for that. Amen. Thank God I do for that. Now, in retrospect, as I look at these three cases, all of these people had three things in common. Number one, they were zealous. They were completely sold out to God. They were, you know, they might have been a little misguided, but they had common sense enough to stop and take another look, another angle, and see what was going on in their life. Number two, they had an outstanding prayer life. Their prayers were focused, intense, and consistent. They were consistent with their prayers. You know, it's, it's a shame to pray for something and pray for it and, and then pray for it and then give up before, you know. I have found in my experience that I'm going to get an answer. It's either yes, no, or wait a while. Come on. You will get an answer to prayer. And if you haven't got the answer yet to the situation you're praying about, then you haven't prayed long enough. Come on. You haven't prayed long enough. 
God don't want us to be quitters. Man, can you imagine New England Patriots? Down 28 to 3 at halftime if they'd have been quitters. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm a fan either way. But I'm just saying don't give up. Don't give up. See, Their prayer life, all of these people, their prayer life was consistent. It was intense. It was focused. And number three, they were humble and obedient. And that goes hand in hand. You say, well, Brother Hickman, I'm not been disobedient. When's the last time you sit there with your hands folded when whoever was up behind the uh, podium asked you to raise your hands and praise God? Hmm. Come on, I'm not blind. I'm just a little bit, have a little bit of vision problem, but I'm not blind. And I sit up here on the platform. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So there it is. How about let's gather around the front a little bit as the musicians come and bring down the spirit. Singing is such a vital part. The first king of Israel had a restless spirit, and he had to have somebody king sing and play music to calm his spirit down. Amen. Amen. Let's ask God. To give us a different look, take another look. You know, he might have been hinting with you to do something else with your life, and you haven't been taking the hint. So when you pray and talk to him, give yourself a little time for him to answer. Don't do all the talking. Amen? All right. Lord Jesus. Chains are loose when lives are revealed. Your peace. 